Good morning and welcome to Lincoln Heights Christian Church. My name is Chris Rusin. I get the privilege of being lead pastor around here and I'm excited about today and I'm so thankful that we're moving through this week, okay? So here's my encouragement to you. I know there are some in the room and online who are you know, with the lecture results, they're like, yes! <laughs> and there's other ones in the room that are like, oh God, help us please, okay? So I understand that. Here's my encouragement to you. No matter who's present, Jesus is king, amen? Amen. And I want, I want to remind you again, last week's sermon was focused on like uncommon unity. We've got to display that. We've got to have that, that love for one another and, and making sure that, that we're, we're loving each other, we're loving those who are different from, uh, from us, and also to praying for our leaders. And you go, Chris, come on, I don't want to do that. That's what God wants us to do. The Bible talks about us praying for our leaders. And so we're going to do that right now and just stop and ask God to be here. So would you pray with me? God, we love you. And God, we need you. And Father, we pray right now for our leadership. God, I pray that God, you give them wisdom, incredible wisdom. God, to give them incredible just people around them to help them. I pray that you protect them. God, the leaders at our, at our national level, God, our state level, our local level. Father, we pray for our leadership. And Father, we also just pray and ask in the name of Jesus for your peace right now. That you remind all of us in the room and all watching online that you are still God no matter what. And Father, I ask that you please be in this room and blow us away with your presence. God, we don't want a normal church day. We want something different, something bigger, something better. God, we want you to blow us away with your presence. So God, please, Lord, please speak through me. May people see you and not see me. May they hear you and not hear me. May you have your way here today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Today we're bringing a brand new sermon series that we're calling Irrational Generosity. What is Irrational Generosity, Chris? Oh, well, great question, okay? Here is, here's, here's what I mean by it. Irrational Generosity is generosity that, that doesn't make sense. It's charity of the rarity type. It's unreasonable relinquishment of something important. It's philanthropy in response to a freedom and not for a feeling. It's bountiful benevolence when all you own is bears, beets, and Battlestar Galactica. Chris, that's just a silly alliteration technique that you're using in a sermon. I am, plus a love for the office. I love it, okay? So anyways. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, what is irrational gen generosity? And this is a, a, a main point that we're going to use often throughout the sermon. Just remember this. It's giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. Let me say it again. It's giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of of profit. Pastor and author Andy Stanley, he tells the story of a little boy who was scolded by his mom because he didn't want to share his lunch at school. Now, you know, the mom looked at the kid and said, come on now, you know better. We're all about sharing and stuff. It's all pre-COVID, of course, you know, so it's okay. And, uh, and basically, Andy goes on to share the irony in all of this is that we expect our children to grow up understanding that Basically, possessions are for sharing. Yet, when it comes to our own affairs, we act as if our possessions are for the keeping. Maybe it's because as we grow into adults, we begin to view sharing as simply something that's irrational, something that just really doesn't make sense. We tell ourselves that we worked hard for what we have. It's ours, not theirs. And besides, if there's any extra or leftover, I need to keep it because God only knows when the next toilet paper apocalypse is going to hit us all, okay? And so I need to be ready and stocked up for it because you know when the you-know-what hits the fan, you don't want to be left without any TP, okay? You want to be able to say this on the screen, that you survived the toilet paper outage of 2020. I guess it's happening again this week. I, I, I found out Costco's running out, other stores are running out. I, it's funny to me, uh, back when it happened the first time, I noticed two main things. That first of all, toilet paper was gone, sure. I also noticed that with the Trader Joe's, you don't go there for toilet paper, but uh, they do have some. But what I also noticed, the shelves were empty of all 
the snacks. The munchies were gone. So here's what I know of American, okay, Americans. When the you know what hits the fan, we get the munchies, okay? And then we eat a lot of munchies, so much so, we need a boatload of toilet paper, okay, to take care of all those munchies afterwards, all right? So that's how we roll as Americans, and that's pretty interesting to me. No, so, so sometimes we keep and we hoard as adults because we start believing, especially in the midst of a crisis, that our possessions will keep us safe. We start believing this, that our possessions will keep us safe. And if we truly start believing that our possessions will keep us safe, then giving them away will, of course, become something irrational to us. Why would I give something so precious away when my purpose is to keep me and mine safe from the peril? But what if you and I considered a different purpose in life, a better purpose, a purpose that's focused less on possessions and focused more on being possessed and filled up with something good instead of something full of greed? What if our possessions are actually keeping us from this something good that God has in store for us? Maybe the real issue isn't so much about me keeping my possessions. Maybe it's more about my possessions keeping me from what I truly need. And what do I need? What do you need? I need love. Personally, I need peace. I need security. I need to be forgiven. I need to be given a purpose. A purpose that's bigger and better than just keeping me and mine safe from the peril. I need to break free from the cage of making comfort be my king. And maybe you need these things too. And maybe you have allowed comfort to become your king. And the result of that is that we're basically trapped in a cage that we don't even recognize that. And we don't understand that it's actually keeping us from the something good that God has in store for us. And what if irrational generosity is the key to escaping from the cage? Jesus talks about this irrational, irrational generosity in Acts 20, 35. He is quoted as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I don't know about you, but man, growing up is the opposite. It's more blessed to receive than to give. And learning that it was the opposite, you know, that Jesus wants something different, it, was, it just blew my mind. It's very countercultural, and that's who Jesus is. He's so countercultural. And, and he's trying to lead us to something bigger, something better, and understand a more important purpose. See, why would Jesus say this on the screen? Why would he say it? Because, you know, it, it, try to guilt us? No. Because Jesus needs some cash? Need some hundies? No. Because friends, need, other people need some cash? No. Oh, because the church needs some cash? No. The reason why Jesus, I believe, says this is because he knows his creation. He knows you. He knows me. He knows that if you and I are ever going to receive anything, then we're first going to have to let go of the death grip that we have on our stuff. As we let go of the death grip, then we're able to receive what he has for us. Again, the blessing mentioned here, the blessing in this verse is not that you and I would have more stuff to possess. The blessing is that we would have more Jesus to possess us. You see, the blessing is being saved by Jesus. Amen? But friend... You'll never let Jesus save you as long as you believe your possessions will. It's something you and I have got to decide. We've got to call out. Jesus is offering salvation for all of us. And, it's, and I'm not talking about salvation just from the burning fires of hell. Guys, come on now. There, you know, what, what makes heaven heaven and hell hell? What makes heaven heaven is God's presence. And what makes hell hell is the absence of his presence. And maybe you and I are walking through our own living hell recently because we're just trying to do it without God. And God's like, stop it. Just stop it. 
I, I'm offering this salvation, I'm offering my presence to all of you in the midst of the crisis right now. I love you right where you're at. But Chris, I gotta clean up my life first, right? No, he loves you before you clean up your life. He loves you that much. And that's incredible love. It's irrational love, which will lead to an irrational generosity as well. Friends, this is why Jesus talks about irrational generosity. It's why we're going to talk about it today. Because we need more Jesus in our lives, not more stuff. Amen? Let's try it again. We need more Jesus in our lives, not more stuff. Amen? Yeah, you know, when there's like at least this many people in here, because like the first service there's like, you know, 10. Okay, so, so the rest, with this many people, I get more excited, okay? So I'm glad you're in here one more time. We need more Jesus in our life, not more stuff. Amen? Amen. Yes, thank you, my friend. Here we go. Now, for many of us in the room and many of us watching online right now, understand this, the key to breaking free from the cage of comfort, the key to breaking free from believing that possessions will save us is to simply start embracing and irrational generosity. So let's dive into the Bible and talk about how, the, how to embrace it. Turn your Bibles to Luke 12, verse 13. Uh, we love the Bible here at Lincoln Heights. That's where our capital T Truth comes from. Uh, I want to encourage you to get used to using the Bible. Some of, there's some Bibles that are under chairs in front of you, or maybe you're sitting in one. If you don't have a Bible, take it home. Chris, is that legal? Yes, it's legal. All right, take the Bible. It's free. Or get your phone out, okay? And then go to BibleGateway.com and bring up another, just another uh, browser if you're watching online and follow us. I want you to get used to using the Bible. Don't be intimidated by it. As you go over there, you might see a subtitle that says The Parable of the Rich Fool. Before we dive in, I want to remind you of this three-part definition I mentioned earlier regarding irrational generosity. Irrational generosity is giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. That's the three-part definition of it I want to go through today. Today we're going to down, really break this, this definition down and process it, and we're going to do so within the passage regarding the parable of the rich fool. And the result will be three how to break free with IG points. Three, three of them. Three how to break free with IG and IG sword for irrational generosity. Here we go. Now, ir, n- number one, how to break free with irrational generosity, point number one, is to be found in the first part of the passage. It says this. Now, just so you know, Jesus, the context here, the book of Luke is the first, one of the first four Bible, four books in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all talk about the life and teachings of Jesus. Jesus is traveling around doing miracles, healing people, helping people. He's also just taking time to stop and just preach truth. And, and, and he's getting a crowd. It's getting around him. And the crowd's getting excited. And, and a lot of the, you got to be real, real, real honest here, a lot of the crowd, they just want something from him. They're just like, yeah, just, just give me some healing. Just take care of this problem for me. And, and they're missing the point. And, and Jesus, because he loves no matter what, there's always grace, but he's going to challenge us and challenge the group here in this crowd to go deeper. So as he's sharing just how good God is and how generous and how wonderful he is and what he's done and how good he is, this happens. Then someone in the crowd called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Pause. In this part of the passage, I see a few things. First of all, it would just, I see this dude, when Jesus is getting deep about, you know, how much God loves us and what he does, everybody's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I see that hand back there. Yeah, can you go ahead and take care of this estate issue between me and my brother? Okay, dad's dead. Fine, whatever. I want the money. Okay, so tell the brother to give me the money. All right? Let's do this. And Jesus is like, <laughs> I, I got to believe inside. He's like, you got to be kidding me. Okay? And he goes like, Okay, I'm not going to get that low with you. That's not what I'm going to do. But what Jesus is so good, he meets us where we're at always. He meets this fulio in the back with a hand raised and over a dumb question that would be really dumb in the context that we're talking about here. And he meets him right where he's at and goes, sorry, not going to do that. But by the way, that helps me think about something. And he says this. He's like, I'm not going to deal with that. But he says, by the way, beware. Guard against every kind of greed because Brother in the back, you got some greed you're dealing with. You want that estate money, don't you? You think that possession is going to give you what you need. Because beware of that greed. And he says life is not measured 
by how much you own. That's encouraging, especially in an American culture when we see our neighbors drive up a new car and we go, I wish I had that. Or we go over to a friend's house and we go, this furniture is really nice, I wish I had that. Or we see a friend's TV and go, oh my gosh, it's amazing, I wish I had that. You know, we, we basically look at the stuff around us and clothes people wear too, and we go, I wish I had that. You know, I would feel better if I just had that. And that's something that our culture, I believe, conditions us to believe constantly. And we've got to fight it. And Jesus is trying to remind us, kind of ground us in some truth by saying life is not measured by how much you own. In other words, success is not defined by the amount of stuff you've got. Success in life is going to be defined by something deeper. And where he's leading to, he's leading towards success being connected to a relationship with him. Now, the word beware. When I see the word beware, I think of this type of sign, okay? The beware of dog sign. Now, if you see a beware of dog sign, you better be thinking twice. If you're going by like someone's house and you, hear, you know, see that sign, you, you better be thinking it could be anywhere between a ginormous monster dog to a little chihuahua that'll bite your ankles and drag you into a hole, okay? So it could happen, all right? And you're thinking to yourself, I gotta be ready for this dog no matter what and look out for it. It reminds me of the story. Uh, back when I was 10 years old, my cousin Brian Rusin, uh, Brian Rusin, he visited from Washington State, came down. He's about three years older than me. Um, we were looking for something to do on a Saturday. We go, how about we ride bikes a half a mile from the house I grew up in, is, is my, my elementary school I went to. And so I go, how about we go ride bikes there? And my parents were like, yeah, go ahead. And, you know, the problem was it was just me and my sister, you know, growing up, we only had two bikes. So I had to ride the pink bike, okay? And I gave the, the, the boy bike, you know, the, the BMX to my cousin Brian. He's like, yeah, let's go do this. So we go riding down to the school. And, and it's a great, great open green field with some blacktop area. And it's a great spot. There were no, like, fences back then. It was all free. And we're having a good time riding our bikes around. Now, it would probably be going for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then I spot some dude with his dog start walking into the green grass area. Now, this dog was magnificent, okay? It was like a bear dog. It was huge, all right? And, and, and it was, it, I just from, from 100 yards away, I could tell it was just something to be aware of. And I also noticed something also in the story that the dog did not have a leash on it, okay? Now, I love dogs, I'm a dog person, but I'm a big believer in leashes because you never know what's gonna happen, what's gonna distract that animal to go after something else. So in that day, what distracted that animal to go after something else was my pink bike, okay? So I, I believe it just saw the bike, it saw me, I locked eyes with it, and it just it returned the glare with this. It was so bad, it was like anger came over and it was trying to, to protect its owner. I believe it and it made a beeline after me. I started riding that banana pink bike, as fast, banana seat bike, as fast as I possibly could. I'm just like, I'm, just, I'm, 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 like ah, ah, I'm screaming out, Brian, Brian, help! The dog owner is screaming out, precious, precious, precious. I'm like, no way that dog's name is precious, okay? That is no way, that thing is so angry looking, it's so mean and intimidating, it is just galloping, <laughs> full speed at me, and I'm like, I'm going to die on this elementary grass field. And I'm like, Brian, Brian, and precious, precious, and, and I'm just trying to go as fast as I can, and I'm riding this way, and this is a cool moment. It's like a, it's like a Star Wars scene where they're you know, fighting over the, the you know, Death Star, the X-Wings and TIE Fighters, and everybody's helping each other. So I'm going this way, straight as an arrow, with my bike trying to get away from this dog. It is trailing me, and it's catching up. And I'm like, I'm trying to do like, you know, serpentine, serpentine. Serp it's not working, okay? So I'm going as fast as I can, and all of a sudden, Brian, I'm like, where are you? He comes out of nowhere, and he's coming from this direction, okay? Timing it just right. And what he does, he goes into Ghost Rider mode. You know what Ghost Rider mode is, okay? Ghost riding mode is this, okay? If you're going to ghost ride your bike, ghost riding your bike means you jump off, okay? As it's traveling at full speed, you, you're like, you're just like, and you jump. And so he does, he, goes, he jumps off, and the bike keeps going, and it hits that dog just perfectly. Bam! Now, it didn't kill the dog, but it definitely stopped the dog, and it was super cool, okay? And I was like, Brian, you are the coolest. She's like, yeah, I know, I know. So it was awesome. Now, Chris, what's the point? There is a point, I promise, all right? There's always a point. Here's the point. Remember the definition of irrational generosity. 
Remember, it's giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. Now, the how to break free with IG, point number one is this, beware of the greed dog. It's usually what you call precious. The things in your life that you call precious, the things that you work so hard for, things that you, put, you, you give so much time towards, these are the things that you and I would call precious. And these things are also, they can become just something that, that creates a greed in us, that drives us to want it, to take it, to keep us safe, to, to make us feel successful. And what Jesus is saying is, beware! You've got to call it out. Look for the precious. And I, know, I love how the Lord of the Rings do with Gollum. You know, he's like, my precious. <laughs> we are not like that. We know how to cover that. But deep inside, we might be that way. This is my precious. My TV, my truck, my tools, my clothes, my shoes, my equipment, whatever it is. You know, I, my sports stuff, my music stuff. I just, this is mine. Mine. And God's saying, beware of that. It will ruin you. It will encage you. Point number two. How to break free with IG, irrational generosity. Second point is found in the story. Now, Jesus is a great storyteller, okay? He blows everyone away when it comes to storytelling. He makes up these things called parables. And parables are basically an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, you're not meant to, to listen to it and go, that's a great earthly story. Okay? You're supposed to go a little bit deeper with it. And so what he does here is that he, he, he acknowledges the guy in the back's question. Hey, I want you to settle this issue with the, with the, the real estate stuff. He goes, no. Nah. Beware of the greed and also understand that life is not measured by how much you own. And he goes, oh, you know what? Let's just pause. Crowd, we're going to pause. We're going to story time. Grab a seat. Boom. And I believe they do. Okay? And, and then he, he does this. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. We are not an agricultural society in this group here. Even watching online, I bet you don't live on a farm. Okay? I, I, maybe 1% of us do. So we're all city people, but I think we can get the point of the story. Keep going. There was a rich man who had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I got so many crops growing. I don't have room for all my amazing crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns, build up bigger barns. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now for those sitting back that day hearing that story, they might be going a little bit like, that's a great story. I just, I wish I could be that guy. I wish I could be that guy. Have that kind of barn, have the crops coming in. So, I mean, just eating, drinking, being merry. What a great story, Jesus. Thank you so much. Jesus is not done with the story, okay? He's going to keep going. But I do want to point out a few things in the story. First, I want you to understand that in this passage behind me or on screen, please notice this, that me, myself, and I pop up 11 times within four verses. Jesus is trying to drive home a little bit of a point here with this dude. He ain't the hero. He's the zero that we got to be really watchful of that creeps up in our own lives, that makes life be all about me, myself, and and I. See, when we make life be about me, myself, and I, we end up getting sucked into a small purpose, and we miss the bigger purpose. We make the purpose be about keeping me and mine safe from all the peril. That's not what God wants from us, or for us. He wants something bigger and better for us. And, and this, this idea of me, myself, and I, it, it, it gets us thinking so small. You know, again, back to the toilet paper shortage of 2020, I guess we might be going through it again. But I know when it happened the first time, I mean, there were people just freaking out, freaking out. And, and, and you know, people were calling the church, and we're giving away toilet paper, and we're helping the best we can, you know, all kind of stuff, too. And, and then I went up and saw my friend Jeremy Creed, and, uh, and Jeremy and his family attend here, and I went to go visit his house and, and just visit them over there. And I pulled up to his house. In front of his house was this little, like, almost bird box thing, okay? And it was, like, it was, like, well done. Put in the ground real well. It had shelves. And in the shelves, was that it? Oh, there it is. Cool. Okay, it's cool. So it was like all of this, like, 
that like groceries were in there and toilet paper, Palooza was stuffed in there too. And I remember walking up going, what's this dude? He's like, oh, that's just something that we made for our, for our neighborhood, for our community. That we, you know, we started, you know, filling it up, and then we, we had our neighbors join us, and we just, you know, when people go to the store, they just get extra stuff that everyone's around trying to find and put it in there, put it in there. I said, toilet paper included? He's like, oh, yeah, toilet paper. I'm like, oh, wow, you're letting toilet paper be out just on a street for anyone to see? <laughs> and he's like, yes. And here's the thing about Jeremy and his family. They embrace a different type of purpose when it comes to being generous. Their purpose, for, their, their, their purpose is not around, centered around me, myself, and I. Their purpose in being generous is something, for something bigger, a bigger reason, a bigger purpose, to help others. And I know for sure Jeremy and his family, they love Jesus. Oh, they're not perfect. None of us are. But they love Jesus. And they're trying their best to demonstrate this in the best way they know how. And how cool is that? You know, you guys hear, you know, we hear things at church, we go, man, that'd be great someday to, to take that, that point and apply it to my life, but that's for the super holy people. No, it's not. It's for any of us. And the best place to start is to start from the inside of the circle on going on your way out. And the inside of your circle is your home, is then, you know, your neighborhood, and then your, your workplace, your friends, the school that you're a part of, all these things, and look to see how you could be generous in helping other people. See, remember this point, this definition. See, irrational generosity is giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. How to break free from, or with IG, with irrational generosity, point number two is this. Be generous for a purpose bigger than you. Focus on the Father, not a feeling. You see, some of us, what we'll do is we'll be generous because it benefits us. We'll get around me, myself, and I again. We'll say, I want that tax break, you know? I want that great government discount coming in at the end of the year, and I'm going to plan it just right to get that. And that's being generous for me, myself, and I. Your purpose is still centered around you. Or we'll be generous in order to feel good. You know, I, I want to just, you know, give some money, and I want to feel good today. You guys, there's a bigger purpose God has for you. Or we'll be, we'll be generous and say, I want to be generous in order to get this done at the church or at the school or at the organization. I want to control it then. That's still generosity based around me, myself, and I. Your purpose must become bigger, better. And the way it does is by focusing on the Father. And saying, God, I want to be your type of generous. What do you want me to do? I remember myself, you know, I went to a men's retreat years ago. I was in my early 20s. I remember walking in to that, uh, to that retreat and, and, and thinking, you know, all these guys, you know, they're praising God and worshiping Jesus. It was really awesome seeing men do that. And uh, oftentimes they're more reserved. And they were just, you know, saying, I need you, God. I need you. And they're getting up and they're saying, they're confessing things in their lives. And I, I remember sitting there uh, just having, a, I just think, thinking to myself this. I guess, you know, I don't have a little, lot, lot of bad things going on right now in my life. I'm okay. I'm pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. And I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking this way. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm not going to get up there and, and confess anything. I don't have anything to confess about. And then I really believe God said to me, how about your credit card? I was like, yeah, that doesn't count, though, God. doesn't count. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's my thing. It's between me and myself and I. And God's like, no, it's between me and you. And you're trusting your credit card more than you are in me. And this money that part of your life that you're keeping in a corner, Chris, is preventing you from being generous. At that time in my life, I was not very generous. I wasn't. I was on staff at a church. I was a youth pastor, and I was trying my best. And I, I told myself all these things. Well, I'm giving my time. You know, that's most important. And it truly is. Time is something you can't replace, and money you can't. But I told myself, excuse myself, I'm giving my time. I'm not, but I don't need to give my resources. I don't need my money. And God's like, no, here's the problem. It's not a money issue. It's a faith issue. You're not having enough faith in me, and you're putting it all in that credit card. You gotta let go. You gotta let go. Friend, maybe what's keeping you again from being generous again is that you're not being enough aware of what the, what's precious to you. So first be aware of it. And then afterwards, decide to be generous for a bigger purpose. Don't decide to be generous for, for yourself. Do it for, for the Lord and for others. And then we have the third point. The final point is this, and, and it really comes down to the, the third and final point we found in this last part of the story. Now, Jesus, what he does here, he goes, you know what? The story's not over. They're all thinking, man, what a great farmer. He stored all the, uh, all the crops, and, and it was so, so crazy. This farmer, again, 
just so you know, he never once thought about giving the excess to others. He thought, he thought to himself, I'm going to build bigger barns for all my stuff. And I believe the crowd's going, good man, good man, good man. And Jesus follows up with this. But God said to the man in the story, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Now, for those listening to the story, like, uh-oh, the, the story took a, a turn for the worst now. <laughs> Not going good. You know, God, guys, this guy dies, and then he's left with nothing. And then he says this, Jesus in 21, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. And what Jesus does here, he introduces a different kind of rich here. One, the rich fool seemed to completely miss. And he also gives a new definition for fool. Fool isn't just someone's a dumb dumb. Fool is someone who is more interested in being rich in stuff than being rich in a relationship with God. And Jesus is trying to draw that line. Stop being so drawn to being rich in stuff. Be rich in a relationship with me. And I love that he used that word. It's not about a religion. And I say it often. I believe religion sucks. It sucks the life right out of us. But a relationship with God infuses life. Amen? That's what he wants. And this idea of, of, of somebody just hoarding all this wealth and then you die, friend, you cannot take it with you. And when you and I start focusing about this life only and forget about the next life, we are foolish. We were created to be eternal beings. We really are. Chris, what are you talking about? We're not gods, but we have been given a soul that goes beyond this life. I'm telling you, this life will continue. It keeps going. Why invest so much into the short time of our physical life and it's something we can't take with us into the spiritual one that will keep going forever? And Jesus, seeing a big picture, is trying to wake us up, say, stop it. You're going after the little piddly stuff that will not give you what you want. Friend, you've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. What makes heaven heaven is not pearly gates or streets of gold. What makes heaven heaven is the presence of Jesus. Amen? And what makes hell hell, then, is the absence of Jesus. I believe many of us in the room today and watching online are living, experiencing a living hell right now. We're so frustrated, so angry, so, so disappointed, so, so discouraged and, 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 and depressed, and we're all these things wrapped into one, a big, just big mess. And I understand that everything you're feeling is valid and real, and I respect all of it, but friend, understand this. Jesus went to the cross so that you and I may have a taste of heaven now. To have his presence now. In the midst of the crisis. In the midst of all the crap. We don't need to walk through a living hell anymore. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? We have access to hope, love, healing, peace, purpose. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and through the grave. Friend, we do not need to settle for this low level life anymore. We have a bigger picture, a bigger future, a bigger purpose because of Jesus. Now, the last point I'll give you this has to do with skee-ball. Have you ever seen skee-ball? Skee-ball is the bomb, okay? If you don't know what skee-ball is, you can kind of see it by the picture. Basically, I remember doing this with my, with my kids. We'd go to Chuck E. Cheese or Camelot or Peter Piper Pizza, and we these, these games would be all out there. Skee-ball is kind of like a mini, like, like bowling alley thing. You come up to you and get these balls. You put like a buck in there, and you get like five of these kind of hard balls. And you throw them down, down like a bowling ball, and it jumps up like a ski ramp, and it goes into one of these little holes. And you're trying your best, okay, to really have the ball land in one of the hundred spots, okay? Because it, the, the higher the number, the bigger amount of what are you going to receive that pops out? Tickets, right? Now, what's so great about tickets is like, they start coming out. It's like, gee, 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 gee. You're all, yes. And then you put another dollar in there. Yeah, just do it again. And we do it again. And then they go, gee, 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 And then, yes, you know. And then, oh, let's do it again. And then, gee, gee, gee. And then here comes more tickets. And then your kids, I remember my kids too. They're just like, they're so like, oh my gosh, dad, we have so many tickets. And I remember being caught up in the emotion too, going, Let's, let's get some more. <laughs> I put some more money in, and more money. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm putting, I'm putting so much money into this that we walk away with a stack full of tickets. It's like, <gasps> it's amazing. This is everything. Because you know what these tickets can do. And not only is there a skee-ball, 
but somewhere in the room, there is a prize counter that you walk up to and you're just like, oh yes, I've arrived. And you see all these things and you march your kids over there and they, of course they have a glass little area, a little, you know, a little booth that has all the crappy little, 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 you know, you know, little trinkets in it that no one wants. But you look past the trinket counter and you look up there and you see like the stuffed animal, you know, the Nintendo system, the Xbox, the full on electric guitar, you know, the, like the, the chair you sit in that has a car seat that you play the game with to steer the car. It's like, it's like, this is everything. You know, the, the, I mean, you're like this, I want this. And your kids are like, dad, I want that. I want, because they see this, you know, this must give us like anything we want. And, 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 and as a dad too, I'm like, it, it just might. Who knows? It might. You know, we got so much here. And then, and they start, they, they, the first the counter's off, let's count the tickets, you know. <laughs> they start counting them. And back in the old days, you go, one, two. And you're like, oh, God, hurry up, please. Now they have a whole, I think you can like put it in a little, a little basket, and it counts it by weight. And you're like, oh, it's great. It's, it's so instant. It's amazing. But my kids, you know, they're watching us go down, and all of a sudden, we end up with, like, you have earned 3,700,045 tickets. And you're like, yeah, woo, what's that getting me? And they bring you over to the glass trinket area, okay? And you're like, oh, I'm sure we're just on our way somewhere. And they stop, and they go, you get this. It's a, it's a squishy penguin um, with, with, with glasses on. And you can squish it. It doesn't even make a noise, but it's squishy and it's fun. How about that, kids? And your kids are all, what? <laughs> I don't want that crap. You know, that's what I, I, I put so much in it. As a parent, I'm like, I just dropped 120 bucks in that ski ball for this? And then I was like, what? And, and this is so, I think, uh, the ski ball illustration, I think, really connects to life because I'm telling you, instead of these, what we go after is this. And we go, man, I just, this is what I need. This is what I'm going to work hard for. This is what I'm going to give up time with my family for. Because this will give me everything I need. This will make things right. This will make all of it worth it. If I just get enough of this and invest all my resources and time into getting more of this, then I'll be kept taken care of. My, me, my, me and mine will be safe from all the peril. We'll be just fine if I invest into this. But when we get to that point, we start using this and cashing this in, we end up with stuff like this. We end up with that house, that car, that retirement, that vacation, and we still feel empty. And we're going, why? I thought that was going to make it better. I thought that would save my family, save my marriage, save my, my, my insanity, you know, from just losing my mind. I thought that was going to help me, and it didn't. And God's going, oh, remember the parable of the rich fool? You're him. What are you doing? What's so great about Jesus, though, what's so great about God, he meets us right where we're at. Even those moments when we're like, I'm the rich fool, God goes, but come here, I love rich fools. Come here. I'll help you. I'll help you. Come here. Just beware of the precious. Choose a bigger purpose in your generosity and understand, again, this, this definition, giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. Don't be interested in the profit of cash and stuff. Be interested in a, in a grander profit, something that, that, that's more meaningful, that has more, more punch, more pizzazz, more life. See, how to break free with IG, point number three, start investing your resources into what matters most, the profit and gain of knowing Jesus as Lord and leading others to him as well. Amen? That's the profit that we are to be be investing into and working towards to know Jesus, not some religion about him, but know him as that friend, know him as that Lord, know him as that Savior, to be real and authentic with him and to bring that Jesus to other people, knowing that that investment will have eternal significance. That people knowing Jesus won't just re release them from living through a living hell, 
But knowing Jesus will go beyond this life into the next chapter for eternity. Friends, this is what I'm talking about. You and I must be smarter about where we invest our resources. Not just our time, but our money, our cash. Don't make it be about you. Make it be about God. Make it be about his kingdom. Be generous for the right reasons. The big point today is this. Irrational generosity is giving something precious for a purpose that makes a different kind of profit. And may we today decide, if we haven't already, decide today to start investing our resources more wisely. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we thank you. And we ask, God, in the name of Jesus, that you help us embrace an irrational generosity. One the world looks at and says, that's crazy. Why would you do that? And our, and our response is not because of some points we learned in a, in a, in a sermon, but, but God, but some personality in you, a character trait that we see in you, because we, we're going to be generous because you were generous to us first. You gave to us your one and only son. You were generous. You took that, that thing that was most precious and you gave to us for a purpose that was bigger than you. It involved us coming to know you being rescued that resulted in a different kind of profit. But God, thank you for modeling generosity. Help us to embrace it. Help us to live it out starting today. God, we confess that we need you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Friends, uh, before I go into this next part, I want to give you a challenge as you go into communion. The challenge I want to give you is this, just three things. One, I want to challenge you as you commune with God and talk to him, Beware of precious. Beware. List two precious things that might get in the way of you being generous and share it with someone you trust this week. That's, uh, you know, conf- something that, can, that, you, that has, you have confidence in. And number two, focus on the Father this week. Ask God to help you embrace a bigger and better purpose in being generous. Something bigger than just a tax credit. Know that you're investing into a kingdom God's kingdom, not your own. Number three, invest in what matters most. Commit to investing your resources into a kingdom that will never fade. And that's what God's kingdom is. It never fades. Friends, consider that this week. And as you go into a communion moment with the Lord, if you're in the room, sorry if you're, if you're, if you're online, but if you're in the room, we have little, little cups that have uh, juice and wafers. And I want you to know, heads up, spoiler alert, they're disgusting, okay? But if you are watching at home, you are blessed to not be a part of this moment. So get your own grape juice or your own water and a Triscuit or whatever. But here's the point of it. Jesus knows that as humans, as his creation, we forget things. This is the moment that we remember that the, the blood or the, the juice is symbolic of his blood shed on the cross. And the, and the wafer is supposed to be symbolic of his body broken. And we're supposed to take this time and not make it be religious, make it be relational. Sit at the table with Jesus. And remember what he's done. D- don't picture him looking at you going, loser, you better feel guilty about me dying for you. That's not what Jesus is doing. In this moment, picture him saying, oh, I'm so glad we could have this time together. I love you. Remember what I did on the cross? That's for you. I love you. I care about you. I did that so that we could have this now. So let's enjoy it. Do that with the Lord. Thank him for dying for you. Thank him for loving you in the midst of your rich, full status. Thank you. And enjoy your time with the Lord.